gentlemen to be here today to give the radio aspect of uh, what we heard tonight and the film aspect of what we heard. They'll each talk about their reactions and um, tell us what they want to, but we also want to hear from you. So if you have questions for them or comments, we really want to hear your voice as well. So uh, please help me welcome Ken and Bill. So I don't know if the two of you decided who would go first. Uh, no, you're the elder. Go ahead. You're the elder. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's true. Oh, and I meant to say the shadow is here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, had, I thought I would uh, dress for the occasion, and uh, I would uh, come as uh, the shadow, uh, dressed in black, and I put on this leather coat that I found up at the farm. And Elizabeth said, oh, oh, you're going as an old moldy Johnny Cash. And I said, <laughs> okay, that's out. And uh, the only thing I could find was my vest that Roberta gave me over at uh, Cabot that I thought might replace that. And so and anyway, here I am. And I'm pleased to be with you because I was a great fan of radio drama and still think that it was something that went off the track in 1954, which was very important to us, and this was a sterling example of, of what radio was and what radio needed to be and probably will never be again. Mm. Well, my primary interest in this presentation is Orson Welles. I mean, he was... Um, he thought of himself as a genius who was very precocious, uh, began th uh, directing theatricals at a very early age, 12, 13 years old. Uh, he had a very troubled childhood. Uh, his parents, his father was an alcoholic, his mother died when he was quite young, and he was shunted from home to home to home, uh, various people looking after him, and none of them very well. Um, he got his start in theater. He was uh, 17 years old, and after his father died, he got a small inheritance and used it to go to Ireland, walked into a theater in Dublin, said that he w announced to the director who was conducting rehearsals there that he was a great uh, Broadway uh, actor, great star on Broadway, and he, did they have any parts that he could play? And of course they knew that he was just a kid, they knew he hadn't, hadn't had any theatrical experience, but the director of the theater was just so thrilled with this guy's cheek, and that really is one of the keys to Orson Welles, not just in, in, in his experience in Dublin, but here, he was a cheeky kid. He was a young kid who never really grew up. Um, and that, that was alluded to in this presentation we saw tonight, saw tonight, where he was with mock serenity saying, well, I had no idea that anyone would take this <laughs> seriously. And, well, of course, he knew very well what he was doing, and he did it deliberately. And that's shown, and uh, they, they just touched on the fact here that um, as a result of the, all the publicity that came from this, RKO Pictures gave him a sweetheart contract that it, they had never given anybody. Uh, all of the things that you saw, and one of the things that they gave him was Final Cut, which is just extremely unusual. And so as a result of that, um, he was able to produce um, Citizen Kane, as, as, as was stated, which up until this past July has been considered by film buffs all over the world the greatest motion picture ever made. And Citizen Kane was, once again, um, and, uh, he, was, he was urinating on the leg of one of the most important people in the Hollywood community, which was, um, which was Hearst. The Hearst owned the newspapers, produced um, uh, uh, movies for his, for his girlfriend, Marion Davies, and various other people, William Randolph Hearst. He was one of the most powerful people in the Los Angeles Hollywood community. And, the screenplay that, um, that, that uh, Wells came up with was a mockery of, of Hearst, and, um, and it just set the tone for the rest of his life. I mean, that he had that one great opportunity to make an unfettered film. He made it, and because of who he insulted, 
it just determined the course of his film career th thereafter. So that's my primary interest in this. One of the things I have to mention, though, I can't get over. This is a one-hour broadcast. Uh, and at the beginning of the broadcast, they saw flashes on Mars. And then 10 minutes later, they're landing in. <laughs> That, didn't yeah. anybody yeah. think of that? I mean, yeah. no. now we think it takes, well, we know it takes eight months to get from oh, yeah. here to Mars or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And that was just one of the facts that just leaps out at me when I hear this broadcast. But we do the same magic with film. Yeah. I mean, we make these incredible leaps with film. Mm -hmm. And we buy the whole package, uh, if they're well produced and well made, as this one was. Didn't he also do a movie could called you, Could you speak up yeah. just a bit? Didn't he also do the movie called The Third Man? Yeah, oh sure. Yeah, which is he, it, was, it, was, it was a British production, and he actually just acted in it. Yes. So that, Susan Kane, changed his musical, uh, music, movie career. In what way did it change it? Because of, uh, the, because of the fact that he insulted William Randolph Hearst, Hearst, first of all, he um, ordered all of his newspapers, and there were dozens and dozens of them across the country, major newspapers. He was the Rupert Murdoch of his day. Uh, they, he ordered his newspapers not to mention Citizen Kane in any of their publications. It was never mentioned. And they made a, a direct attempt to buy every single print, including the original negatives, so that they could burn it. Uh, they wanted to destroy it. Hearst was a very powerful man, and uh, he had a when, when as a result of War of the Worlds, Hearst had a two-picture contract with RKO, um, and he did this, and then he did uh, the Magnificent Ambersons immediately afterwards, and thereafter he never got that kind. Of, he never got funding from Hollywood again. Uh, he had to spend the rest of his life, the rest of his, his creative life, scrambling for money for these projects that he would continually come up with. And mostly he got most of his money in Europe. Uh, he, he did uh, films starting in, in 1945 uh, he, with A Stranger, and he, did, uh, he, he acted in, in The Third Man. He would, he would, he would act in these various, uh, various um, uh, film productions to get the money that he needed to film his own productions, because he, he was hungry for the freedom that he had on his first film, and he never got it again. Uh, the, last, the next movie that he did that was sponsored by, um, by a major studio was The Touch of Evil in 1957. And even then, the studio was on his back every single day. And, they, and he, he didn't get final cut. He, they actually, they, he finished the production, did his own edit, submitted them, a film to them, and they cut it completely. They just changed it all around, changed scenes around, eliminated all sorts of things. So he, he, re, he regretted toward the end of his life. He said, after Citizen Kane, I should have gone into something else because I spent almost all of my creative career begging for money. So that's how it affected him. I wanted to ask Ken what happened in 1954 the change <laughs> the radio. Oh, that, I'll, I'll get to that because it's an Not important enough. part of the story. I always considered Orson Welles was really schizophrenic, and you alluded to the fact that, or, or the film did, uh, that it got down to the final review and edit of that program, and he wasn't around, and he showed up at the last moment, and he went in and saved what was a boring program, and he turned it around literally overnight. And, and created this thing. My interest in Orson Welles is Orson Welles, the radio dramatist. Uh, I intended to play and I don't need to, uh, sure? but most of you are familiar uh, with the shadow. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow, right? That's the voice of Orson Welles who did that program for years, 1934 up to, I believe, through 36, 37. And he was responsible for a, a whole lot of what that became, because at that time, in radio drama, uh, that was one of the first continuing episodic programs that was created that really had people on edge, and there were a lot of others that came along. But at the same time, his involvement theater-wise was also radio theater-wise, which was a whole new dimension. And imagine, 
what you heard there without knowing about any of the film or so forth is, is what interests me because drama <clears throat> for the imagination of man to me was far more interesting than pictures. Uh, and you know that from television. I mean, you see it ad infinitum. But nothing can be as horrible or as frightening or as dangerous as what one's own imagination can create. Orson Welles was a master. And the early chapters, that program too, started in, the shadow started in 1934 and ran to about 1954, over 20 years. He wasn't with it that long because he was never with anything too long. He was in, he was out, he was part of this, part of that. But his radio background was incredible. Uh, all these radio dramas, and, and his buddy in that was Agnes Moorhead. And they did all kinds of stuff together on radio. And radio really became the theater of the air and the theater of people's imagination. So imagine the screen and you are painting there a picture for you to consider. The people that heard this program saw that in their imagination and they created this monstrous story that Orson Welles was brilliant enough to rewrite. He knew what he wanted to do and he took the best of what radio could do and wasn't particularly doing in the news department and turned it into this incredible one hour. One of the things about that when it aired, Orson Welles had enough horsepower with CBS, there were no commercials in it. And that was another reason. It had, a, a, until they got to a 10 second ID toward the end of the program as to what the program was and that it was produced by this, uh, what was the name of the theater? I, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget and I have. Uh, but the March of Time was a big radio program before it was a short motion picture piece. And he copied so much from the March of Time, which did that kind of editing and moving and, and carrying about to keep people's interest, which he truly understood how to do. Have any of you seen the Hitchcock film, The Birds? The Birds was originally produced for radio. And if you can ever find a copy of it, and you think the motion picture of the birds is frightening, wait until you hear it. Take everything out of your mind that you think you know about it, and it is one of the most frightening programs. Uh, I think Orson Welles did Mr. Ocularis, that CBS radio workshop, which had another name. And without my glasses on, I, oh, the, uh, the Mercury Theater of the Air was this one. but. The one that did uh, The Shadow and other of those dramatic forms uh, was another part of that piece. And it seemed like it was a wonderful chance because you could, you could really think about how you made people's minds work and that you could make these characters into something that were of some significance. Uh, and of course it got homogenized and pasteurized as everything does in motion pictures and in radio and all of that. And, it, and, and in the year 1954, I, I went to university because I wanted to be a radio writer so bad. Uh, I grew up on the inner sanctum. And, uh, and I went to school with a professor who had written it. He also wrote a soap opera and they were so bored with a soap opera, this 15 minute Porsche face, like one of those things. <laughs> that they decided, he and, and, and fellow writers, because you had to turn that stuff out by the ton. Uh, one time they, they uh, got the, uh, the heroine pregnant and it was going along swimmingly and they decided this will be kind of interesting. And they kept her pregnant for almost two years. <laughs> and when the, when the baby was born, the network was overwhelmed with layettes and diapers and clothes for the damn thing. Same pair on another show, because everybody intertwined and worked with everybody else, kept a lady on the, tele the opening of the program. As you remember, Marge was on the phone talking with George about, right? Phone call lasted six weeks, five days a week. Nobody 
got it. I mean, because the scenes were short and they moved along, but they thought that was a record, keeping this poor soul on the phone for six bloody weeks. But that's what you could do with radio because you could move it, and of course they had the beauty of commercials, they could break away and come back and so on. But more than that, uh, my sense of, about all of this was the story of the human being and their interest in the macabre and in the stuff that we fear. And this goes all the way back to we as children reading Grimm's, or having read to us Grimm's fairy tales. Pretty scary stuff. And there's a part of us that really thrives on pretty scary stuff. On the other hand, you got to the 1930s in the history of the United States, and you heard Roosevelt here, nothing to fear but fear itself. And that's because we were going hungry. That's because there was a depression. That's because that was the most, fr we'd had a pretty good run for quite a while. And, and, and we'd had recessions and little depressions all the way back to, to the time that when uh, uh, Jefferson was president and fighting with Hamilton all the time about keeping this country from becoming a monarchy. That, that continued, but that was the one time that stopped us cold. It stopped us as cold as the 1927 flood did here in Vermont. And incidentally, I hope all of you noted that in the pictures of those radios, there was an Atwater Kent. It was one of the first radios shown there. And of course, everybody from Montpelier knows where Kent's Corners came, is in the area of Montpelier, and that that was the Mr. Kent from Kent's Corners that created the Cadillac, if you will, of, of radios in that period of time. And uh, we found one that has a clock in it in the front, and you can set the clock so you can, for, for the time you want it, but you had to set it by hand in this circular thing so you wouldn't miss your program, it would turn itself on. That was back a ways, anyway, side light. But the point was that from the time of the Depression on, things were happening in the world. And it wasn't the kind of fear you could deal with as was produced in, in the motion pictures and they did Mary Shelley's Frankenstein when they did Bram Stoker's Dracula, those kind of things. Those we could live with because we could walk out of the theater and go merrily on our way. But there were deeper and darker shadows, and, and they go well back into the early 1930s, Kristallnacht, or Kristallnacht in, in, in Germany. It happened to the Jewish people, and it was frightening, and they had an idea that bad things were coming, and there was no question about it. And the Jewish population worldwide, wherever they were, got that message loud and clear. But at the same time, and you saw those pictures of Germany growing, strange man, and in uh, 1930, I, I want to get these right, 1937, 38, no, 1937, uh, was the light uh, was was the night of long knives in which adolf hitler killed all of his old generals unfortunately and they did it in two days uh, they, uh, over 150 of, of the leaders in the german and this was the old german army and some of the new were exterminated and it was the first sense that they had a, that we, the world, had something very strange and far greater, far bigger shadow than anything we had realized before. Uh, that was pretty frightening. His, Hitler's best friend, Ernst Röhm, big fat guy that had gone all the way back to Munich in the bar halls, killed him. Uh, and, and a new group of German leaders came in. Uh, and it was all directed by a, an incredible, incredible guy in propaganda, Goebbels, uh, who created uh, the Superman and the superpower. And all of those pictures of those youth movements, which I know pretty well because they were shot at racetracks, that Hitler built 
and he built them because he was convinced by Ferdinand Porsche and a guy named Hans Stuck that they had to prove that the Germans could master machinery as well. And they took Auto Union and Mercedes Benz and the world championship races for five or six years. The Germans won every single race until the German Grand Prix in 1939. Killed most of their drivers. But it was a fascinating thing that came out of that and Goebbels was the one who controlled their radio and every one of those races were broadcast and the idea of the superpower kept being pressed forward and we knew about that. I just want to make one point. Uh, you're right about uh, Goebbels in, in Germany, uh, but Joseph Goebbels got his, mar not his marching list, but got his template from a man named Edward Bernays who in 1928 published a book in the United States. He was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. He, he was an American. And he published a book called Propaganda. And um, I forget the name of the journalist who went over to interview uh, Goebbels uh, after, the, after the Nazis took power. And he noticed on the shelf in back of Goebbels, he had a whole bunch of books. And one of them was Propaganda by Edward Bernays, wow. who was an American. And Edward Bernays, uh, he, he invented the term propaganda. He first uh, surfaced in the Wilson administration when they were trying to drum up um, support for the First World War, which is very unpopular. Most people in the United States didn't have, wanted to have nothing to do with the First World War. It's Europe, Europe's problem. But uh, Wilson, for his own reasons, decided to do this. And so they, they established a, a Bureau of Propaganda. It was actually what it was called. Um, and then afterwards, that, that continued after the war. And one of the things you, it was sort of alluded to in this, in this broadcast that we just watched, they sort of danced around the morality of this propaganda that's being this misleading, it's taking, taking advantage of people's uh, credibility and using the, the credulity of the, of the people uh, and, by, and by presenting them with false information, you're really doing something which stretches the bounds of morality. Uh, and lest you think that propaganda has stopped, it goes on to this very day. I'm sure <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to bring up instances, but propaganda. No, but I think it's it's good that we do. I I, I think that's that's one of the the, the new book about Dulles, the Dulles brothers, and the stories that they created and put us into wars after war after war in a period in which this country was not at war. And, and, he, and they knew how to control the press. And they, were, they did it in our lifetime. And they still do it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yes. We, what, what was the book that you were referring to? The one that I was referring to? Yeah. Were you, was there a book that you were referring to? It was, called, it was called Propaganda, and it was written by Edward Bernays. B -E -R -A. No, I heard that. Oh. Um, the, the new Dulles book oh, sorry, is just sorry. out, oh. and it's called the Dulles Brothers, I believe. Oh, how do you spell that? Sorry? How do you spell that name? Dulles. D U L L E S. Oh, yeah. Dulles. Yeah. 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 Pretty well known name. Alan Dulles was the head of the CIA. That's that's right. Yeah. And his brother was Peter. Uh, I forget his brother's name. His brother was the Secretary of State. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But. That was the use of, of media, and the Germans, of course, their films, uh, that, that, what was that lady's name, made those German films for Hitler? Leni Riefenstahl. Yeah. yeah. Which I think everybody that is interested is, is familiar with. But his use of radio uh, was just as powerful. There again, he used the German imagination and created a super hot power, and that's what you can do with radio if you choose to use it as a canvas. Uh, and the other, so the United States, we knew things were not kosher as far as Germany was concerned. We really knew there was something afoot there that was very, very dark. And what never gets talked about today was the rape of Nanking, 1938. And it just has been totally forgotten and you talk about a holocaust in a period of what, two months, the Japanese Imperial Army invaded the capital of China, Nanking, and they killed over 380,000 people, killed them. These weren't wounded, these were killed. Laid out on the uh, streets of Nanking and they ran tanks that over them to get rid of them. And the beheading crime. Of course, yeah, of course. 
and the beheading contests, and we knew about that. That was in our papers. Those were stories that were around in the United States. So here in Europe you had this, and over here we had that, and it created this environment, and this happened before we got to War of the Worlds. Our world was shrinking, and we had these news reports. We knew about the beheading contests of the Japanese officers. We knew about this thing going on in Germany, and we were frightened. So when this came along, and it was Martians, and it was well written and well produced, you can imagine in people's minds, this is the ultimate step, sorry. I'm so glad that I got to see that part of this, the background of why people were so frightened, all of those things in the news about the Martians. My family lived right near there in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and apparently part of my mother and my grandmother believed it or didn't believe it, but they weren't doing anything about it. But one of my aunts was out on the highway, and she was so distraught, she ran into a telephone pole. It was a story that came down through my family. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad to hear the background of why people were so affected. Yes. They talked about the Red of 19 and it being kind of kept quiet except in China. And that same thing goes with Korea and the comfort girls who the Japanese are still not going to be refused to admit happened. Yeah. And and we 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 need to be reminded and, and brought back up to speed on these kind of things because we, we, of course, are so perfect in every way. <laughs> and we're all exceptional, as we've been told. Oh, my heart. Uh, but we need to know what the balances were and, and what created that kind of environment. When this program came on the air, there was fear. And it wasn't the kind of fear where you could go to the motion picture house and walk out, nor to listen to the Lux Radio Theater, and it was over, and you could move on. Hitler's Children, you know, was written as a, uh, as a uh, drama for radio, made, but then made into a movie, and I can't think who made we, it, we but it was a propaganda film. We just played it, yeah. yeah. There, it, you know, what actually happened is, 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 a, is, is still, I think, something of a mystery. I mean, you have, you know, what we just saw was, you know, half a dozen witnesses sort of talked, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that, doesn't, that doesn't prove anything. Uh, you probably should be able to collect some data on telephones from that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can. The, the, you know, the exchanges went down. When the exchange goes down, you know it's overloaded by so much. You can just mm -hmm. guess how many people are on there. And the other problem, of course, is you. The media. Two weeks of this stuff. Everybody who got scared in any way, <laughs> or knew somebody got scared in any way, is now going to come forward to tell their story about what happened to them in response to this radio show. Yeah, and, and, and so you, you, you get a very biased sample of, uh, of, of what's going on. I think so. I'm, so the question is, do, does anybody know anything about well in Vermont? About what? Well, went on in Vermont in, in 1938, with, at the time of this. Uh, well, we had the hurricane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on in Vermont. But, but, but did, you know, did people get out on the streets of Montpelier? <laughs> well, a, a strange part of that was there wasn't any radio stations in Montpelier nor in Barrie. The only radio station was in Waterbury. Okay. And they weren't a member of a network then, so they were getting their news from the wire service, which I think, which I know was United Press at that time. And so that the, the one thing that radio could do was a sense of immediacy. And again, in what Orson Welles did, he took that sense of immediacy and he shrunk it down into a 50-minute program, 55-minute program, because mm -hmm. he realized how that worked. There were these musical interludes in there, and now we take you back to the Roosevelt Hotel and the music of Shep Fields and his Ripley, whatever, you know. And then it would come back as, as they began to uh, entertain this idea that there was something down there in New Jersey. And they would go back to the music, and they would and so forth, and and you couldn't turn it off. What had happened, and they were so right in that thing, was that the competition and the big show, the big big show, was the Chase and Sanborn Hour with uh, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, and Nelson Eddy got up to sing 
and he got in about halfway through this little selection and the dials are going click, 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 click. So they had missed all the beginning of War of the Worlds and the setup to it and what they first heard was about the time that something had landed in New Jersey and they talked to this professor. It was before the, 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 the cap had unscrewed and something was in there and they couldn't tell what and then the guy was so shocked he couldn't speak you about it. Click, click, click. You, know, you, you can say that, but you haven't got any data on that. No. <laughs> let, me, let me just address, I'd like to address something. Um, subsequent studies that have been done on what was the actual effect and there's a dynamic that, has, that wasn't brought out in this, in this, uh, this film at all. Um, the newspapers at the time were th being threatened by the, the increasing prevalence of radio news. And they were losing their readership and they were losing sales. And so uh, part of the, uh, they said there were 12,000 stories or something like that in the subsequent two weeks after this event happened. And it's, it's later been determined that part of that motivation for those stories was newspapers trying to discredit the, v the validity of radio as a news source. And so they would try, they, they kept pumping out these stories day after day after day so that they could show everybody, see radio isn't worth listening to if you want to get real news. You've got to go get newspapers. That's where the real news is. So that was part of the dynamic that was going on. The studies that have been done in, in, in recent years, like 15 and 20 years after this, showed that the actual, the people made a lot of phone calls and there were calls to police stations, there were calls to the radio, to the radio stations. But the number of people who actually left their houses and went out in, in, in panic and desperation turns out to be very few. Once they tried to document that, there were hardly any. It was all just gossamer that was whipped up by the newspapers to create credibility for themselves. Um, I was trying to um, understand um, sort of the timeline of this panic that occurred. I think one of the, um, the people that was interviewed there as a, somebody that had experienced it said it was like at 11 o'clock she figured out that or she heard that it was just something that it had been a story. So that would be a California listener, right? That would be another time period. I mean, it was on from 8 to 9, wasn't it? Was it, it from mm -hmm. 8, like, Eastern eight, time? 8 to 9, Eastern. 8 to 9. So, and so by then... Those yeah, so I don't know where she was from, but I was just trying to get an understanding of how this, this panic got built so quickly. It seemed like, um, you said something about their cutting to music. I thought that there was some mention that they had the whole hour. They did. No oh, but that was part of the deal. That was right, for so the, that they, they started with music. To the fact that this oh, sure. Exactly. Sure. The script sure. was written. And, yeah. and, uh, so why was there not some kind of a response from the government through radio? To, the, to this program? Where, I mean, they were even mimicking you know, somebody in government to try to make it sound. Well, there was, and, and like everything else the FCC does, uh, they gave up on it and uh, went away. I mean, at that, that was the time in the history of radio when uh, they, they said, see here, if we're going to grant you a license, you must operate in the public good need and necessity. And if you don't carry forward and do it our way, we'll take your license away. But the whole thing was like swept under the yeah, rug. Yeah, yeah. So well, the and they, they couldn't the control it. They, they, they realized they had, yeah. And they, they, they did nothing about it. And they did that over and over again to the point where now there'll never be another local station other than the community stations in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Because that, those pieces of paper that grant licenses for a place in, in, on the commercial band, uh, the one in Hardwick sold for almost a million dollars. They hadn't built a station, they hadn't put up a tower, they hadn't gone through Act 250, I mean, and, and so, where do they go? They go to big corporations and lawyers and everything. They're out of the state and it doesn't do anything for Vermont. And at one time you had to prove in radio, in, in that period, the late 30s on, that you, there was a reason for you there, that you were serving a community purpose and if you couldn't do it or you didn't live up to what you said you were going to do, I think that was every two years, they could take your license away. They did in Boston, WHDH was taken away. And, and that, that was the big example in, in New England. But uh, that no longer exists. And the fascinating thing to me is, 
I would give anything if radio drama could come back, and Archer Mayer is trying very, very hard to bring it back. And, and uh, we've done all kinds of talking, but we can't get past it. I mean, where are you going to put radio drama? At what time in the day or evening or extra, so forth? But there is a place for it, and it was really darn good. But my point was that by 1954, radio had got it all figured out. They didn't need to pay for drama they could play a box of records. And lo and behold, by the time I graduated from university, there was no such thing as radio drama. It disappeared in about four years, five, gone. And it's hardly ever heard from except uh, when they have these old time special packages. Uh, when Rachel introduced me, she said I was the founder of uh, WVVY in Martha's Vineyard. And when we got our license, uh, one day a, a young woman came up to me and she said, my father was a producer for NBC Radio in New York City during the 40s and 50s. She said, I've got a trunk filled with scripts for radio drama. Are you interested? And I said, of course we're interested. And so they're putting them on now. They've got, they've got people coming out of the community, putting together these productions like we saw, like, like, like Orson Welles did. Not as good as Welles, but with, with scripts from the 40s and 50s. So there is an interest in it. You're exactly right. People still want to hear this because it works. It's, you're, for the, it works for the reason that you said. It's, it's, it's tapping into the ability of your imagination to create the story yourself. You're actively involved. You're not just passively slack-jawed watching a television. Can tell the story of when there was the flood and you guys had a generator. I listened the whole night long. It was hysterical. At one point, someone said, here comes our loyal le leader swimming up to the porch. And it was, but well, they, they hope people get all that stuff. It, it broadcast all through New England. But you see, that, that is where radio, the kind of radio that Orson Welles was doing, and as I say, he was doing a million things at once, and he, and he was famous for that. That's where radio needs to be. And the sense of, of need is the critical piece there. And I don't think there's much use for radio if they're going to insist on playing a box of records. Because guess what's happened? You know, we always, not we always, that's wrong, it's a generality. But uh, generally speaking, in every generation, uh, the, the young people uh, first break away uh, with the music. That, that's the first thing. That's where they challenge and they listen to their own music. And I, I was thinking the other day, my, my grandmother up in South Albany, Vermont, was shocked and stunned and couldn't believe, uh, and this was way back when my mother was young, that young women were dancing and separating their knees. And this was, un and of course, that was in that <laughs> wonderful period of the 1920s. And th th this was the end of civilization, as far as she was concerned. She was right. And she was right. <laughs> no, what was really right was the 1930s, where Benny Goodman was crucified as the king of swing, and these people were throwing each other around, and underwear was being seen, and that was the end of the world, right? And now we've gone another step. And, uh, and, the, and the kids now say, to hell with you adults, we can create our own networks, when that's called... Uh, 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 Podcasting. Yeah, yeah, and Pandora. Oh, okay. And they, they, they put together what they want to listen to, and Dad, Mom, good luck to you. We're out of here. We're not going to listen to that anymore. No more hiding with your little radio under the pillow so you could listen to whatever you wanted to. That's gone. Now you're back to radio drama, Garrison Keillor. Yes. On the year. Yep. And doing little ones, not big ones. Exactly. For, for, for what, 30 years? Now? Yep. And, and public radio can afford to do it, and I think that's a very good thing. I mean, I think Gary, Garrison Keillor is one of the good things about public radio, no question. But then how do you translate that and make people pay attention uh, uh, with what we do, which is we have to go out and earn our bread every day, like he tries to do, selling tickets, and we have to sell advertising, and and it, that's a, that's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. When you try to do things in that world, <coughs> and good on all of you for at least showing a little fascination about it. Yeah. 
The only other thing I would like to mention here is that after having seen this, you'd think, well, this would never work again. But it has. <laughs> it's, 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 it's been tried and it's, and it's worked time and time and time again. The most notorious was in Quito, Ecuador in 1949. A radio station there did a, the same thing. They localized it. They said, well, somebody's landing right outside Quito, whatever the name of the town was. And when the people discovered that it was just a radio show, people were in the streets, and a more excitable population perhaps than the United States. They stormed the radio station and uh, burned it to the ground. Burned it down. I yeah, and know. seven people were killed. <laughs> and the man, the equivalent of Orson Welles, uh, scooted out of, out of town and he went to Venezuela and never went back. And well, you can be certain we'll never do that at Radio <laughs> Vermont. <laughs> I can't be certain. <laughs> Why not try it? Yeah. Oh it, was, it was done in Buffalo, New York after that, 1969. Really? And it worked. Yes, people, you would think it couldn't possibly work again, but it did. There were radio stations in Rwanda. I don't remember if it was Kigali. There was a book in the library. I can never know what the guy's name, Philip Gordonovich or yeah. something like that, yeah. the reporter. And they, the radio stations, wherever this was, told people to gather in this church. And there's a guy that's a refugee. Here, Adelaide, who was in Kenya. That's related to this Bagdonovich. Yeah. 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 And, and they chopped everyone up in the church. They got them, the radio station said, gather here. They, they used them to, I think it could still happen. You know, it's like, I mean, the morality, I, I'm not sure, but morality, I don't know exactly how to define morality, but that night when you guys got people, one guy called, he was, had a gig in New York, and he listened to your radio station, and when he got home, he called and said, that's how he got home from the gig. We had so several of those, and, 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 and uh, at, a, at a point when we realized how serious that was, mm -hmm. we dropped all of our commercials. Mm -hmm. Because if you do that, then you can go back to whatever the full power allocation is. Mm -hmm. and, and we did that. Jesus, we began by 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, we're getting calls from Massachusetts and Connecticut. You're the only place, because as television goes, once the storm went by New York, it was over. Yeah. It went up the coast right. a little, no, but as far as, as far as northern New England was concerned, hell, there wasn't anything going on up there. And for us, it, it was critical mass. Mm -hmm. and, and, and because we'd had, and particularly because Waterbury had had the experience, because 22 people drowned there in 1927, or from there down to uh, through Jonesville, which was wiped out, and the hospital was, was inundated. But the Army had brought a radio station to Waterbury, Vermont, in 1927, and Herbert Hoover came up here. And that was where I think the first idea germinated about a radio station. And then the fellow that owned the, the Waterbury Record and the Stowe Weekly, they were both published there, one day said, Lloyd, more people can hear than can read. I think we ought to have a radio station. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a that's God's a honest line. proof. That's a good line. Did ham radio play a part in this? I'm sorry. Did ham radio play a part in this too? Ham radio. No. Shortwave. Short She's wave. asking if shortwave uh, played what a, what do you play think? a role. In this, in this broadcast? Well, no, you know, no, it wouldn't general, in this broadcast. Well, in general, for the fear and the hysteria and the no. I thought that was a technical exercise, and at one time it was very important in World War II yeah. because it was another backup support system for us to know. And again, it's the matter of immediacy, and, and that's what radio can do darn well, and it can point a finger, but we have to be pretty careful to make sure that we do it and we don't convolute the conversation. Newspapers can do that. They can write in detail, and that's why they're critically important, and, and that's why the web is going to become more important. Uh, but radio has a way of, of being like a searchlight, and it can find something, and it can and hopefully uh, tease your thinking or your imagination to want to know more. Uh, that doesn't happen because they're all either playing adult contemporary or not adult. Oh, I, I just. <laughs> The Stowe Reporter today, because uh, having grown up and being a little kid in, in that period of Benny Goodman, and it was still around into the 40s, right? And knowing the problems, of what was going to happen to the morals of America because of Benny Goodman and the Dorsey brothers, right? 
Stowe High School in Stowe, Vermont has banned all school dances for the remainder of the year because they don't know what to do about the fact that the children who come to some of the dances are, quote, grinding, and they don't want any of that. And I thought, my God, nothing changes. <laughs> and, and we've got a young woman working for us now. Uh, and we're, you know, we're really trying to get into the millennium age, these younger people. She's 23 or 24, and she's brighter than stink. And, and, and I think she's going to be very successful. And so around the lunchroom, there's five or six of us out there, and they were talking about this story in the Stowe Reporter this week. And uh, she said, boy, I'll never forget. I was in the eighth grade, and I, was, I went to the junior prom to work on it. And she said, I'll never forget. The prom was over, and we were cleaning up. And she said, around and under everything were these little bottles of scotch or gin or vodka. And she said, they were everywhere. <laughs> At, uh, at the uh, dance in Williamstown or somewhere over there where she lived. That's pretty darn interesting. <laughs> Nothing ever changes, does it? But thank you for listening. Yeah. And, uh, thank you very much.